Hey, um, we're going to have some of the testimonies that we'll do next week, some of the youth testimonies. Is that okay? And uh, have them share a little bit. So you got a first part today with video. Second part will be next week. And uh, we'll, we'll do that. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. And if you'd like, you can also turn to Matthew 16, though we will not be there for a little while, but uh, we will be there eventually, as I want to talk to you today about the gospel and the gate. The gospel and the gate. This is going to be a little bit of a short series as we finish out July and into August in preparation for the fall season. In September, we're going to be doing a, a rather lengthy series on spiritual warfare. So I want you to be preparing your heart for that. Invite others to be with you. We should be back to normal come the fall. And we still have lots of people traveling and, and out. But we should be back to full strength. But invite others to be with you during that time and during that season. Um, so today's message is on the gospel and the gate. Several years ago, I began praying and fasting into our destiny as a community of believers. And many of you who were here at that time back in 2005, 2006 will remember. Many of you, however, are new. And I, I have always felt and believed that identity is crucial for an individual. Identity is crucial for a family. And certainly, identity is crucial for a corporate body. I believe that identity is closely tied to vision and destiny. If someone doesn't know who they are in Christ Jesus, they certainly don't know where they're going. If someone doesn't know who they are in Christ Jesus, their destiny will be unfulfilled and their purpose will not be met. Most do not have a vision and are unable to fulfill their destiny in life because they fail to understand what they have in Christ Jesus and who they are in Christ Jesus. How many of you know we have a whole lot in Jesus? Our destiny is tied up in Jesus. Our purpose is tied up in Jesus. Our identity is tied up in Jesus. But if we don't know that, then we're certainly not going to be able to be conformed into the image of Christ to the degree that He wants to conform us. And churches are no different than individuals. Churches also need to have an identity and know their identity and their purpose for existing in a local community. Because if a church as a corporate body doesn't understand identity, then certainly we will not see clearly where God wants to take us as a people and where God wants to take our community. And we certainly will not fulfill our destiny. Too often churches come up with catchy phrases and clever slogans and certain identities that may fit with the fads of our day or the contemporary uh, fashions of society, but who and what they are sometimes gets missing and is faded into oblivion. And if we get caught up in all of the competitive uh, fervor that churches many times go through in order to compete with other churches, then we will lose focus on who we are and what we've been called to do. I've often said that it's not about building a mega church, it's about having a mega influence. And one of the things I believe that God has done here at the gate over the years is He has given us a mega influence, not only in our community, but even beyond our community, into the nation and into the nations. And I believe that is very significant for us in terms of our identity, in terms of our purpose and vision, and in terms of our destiny. So the questions are, what has the King and His kingdom called us to, and how has He identified us to give us confidence on our journey in this endeavor to accomplish His will as a people? That's something we need to remind ourselves of every now and then. This is a series of teachings that I'm about to do that I've done two or three times before every five years or so, and yet it's something we need to be reminded of from time to time. Because the Bible says a lot about gates. And I hope you've studied that and I hope you understand that. And these gates and the gospel, when we look at them and how God uses them in the scriptures, helps us to identify ourselves in Christ and helps us to be able to understand vision and destiny. And so the questions we ask concerning the confidence and the journey that we're all on 
they, these things were answered for me some years ago when we changed our name to the Gate Church. And I think that's very, uh, very important for us to identify with who we are and identify with what our purpose is in our particular community. The Lord took me to the Word of God and He showed me in the Word a clear vision and a definitive identity that would assist us in fulfilling our purpose on earth rather than our own purpose. How many of you know it's not about your purpose? It's about God's purpose for you. And so, this identity is not just for the house of God. It's also something to be embraced by each one in the house. Look at somebody and say, this is for you. Come on. Now say, it's for me also. So you got you got to be thinking that way. you got to captivate your mind. Don't be distracted about what happened yesterday or what's coming tomorrow. This is the moment that God has designed you for. To be in the house of God. To be with other Christians. To be hearers of the Word and, and doers of the Word. And to apply these things to our lives so that we can truly see how we're to function and how we're to serve the Lord. After all, the church is not a building. It is a people. So we are the church of the living God. And for the house of God to be built and to be effective, this is something that we must come to grips with, identify with, and live out every day in our life. And so Jesus is about revealing His kingdom. Jesus is about revealing His heart to each and every one of us who make up the gate church, who are also gates in the house. And living out the purpose of what a gate represents in our community and in our families. And so it means something very significant to us. And Jesus made this revelation very clear. He compared Matthew 16 with the Genesis 28 passage that we're about to read. And he says, building a strong church is what he's concerned with. Christ is about a strong church. And that strong church should be an influential church. And that church brings in the revelation of the kingdom of God. The church is not the kingdom of God, but is the means of revealing the kingdom of God. So in your workplace and in your neighborhood, wherever you do life, in the grocery store, you go in as the church. Right? Come on, are you out there? You go in as the church. But you as the church are purposed to reveal the kingdom of God. In the way in which you talk to people, in the way in which you smile, in your demeanor, in your, in your spirit, in the anointing that's on you. All of those things are of a kingdom nature, though you're going in as the church, a member of the body of Christ. And you reveal the kingdom to others who need to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So if we get that in our heart and get that in our head, then the... The analogies that God uses in His Word will become clear and make sense to us. And this particular topic is of great essence to us. So now we're in Genesis 28. I want to read verse 10 through 22 to you. So would you stand to your feet out of reverence for the Word of God? And we'll begin reading in verse... Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is what? The gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. 
Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So Father, now bless the reading of your word. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. May we make application. Spirit of God, fill us to overflowing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. When Jacob had his dream, in Genesis 28 here, he saw and experienced an open heaven. He also began to see the place where he was as the house of God. He saw angelic movement to and from heaven, indicating that there was a work in progress on planet earth, greatly affected by the powers of heaven. Angels were coming down, angels were going up, he was seeing this, God was allowing him to see into the spiritual realm, and he saw this amazing activity taking place, so much so that he comprehended and became fully aware that God was doing something special on planet earth. How many of you believe God is still doing something on planet earth? And so, he was greatly affected by what he saw. The Lord showed Jacob that God's presence had been in that place all along, even though Jacob was unaware of it. It wasn't until this revelatory dream came that his eyes were open, his heart was open, and he saw something that he had not previously seen. And I believe this is another way in which we uh, function in our lives. God is doing stuff all around us and we don't see it. And it takes something special, something spectacular, a prophetic word or, or an open mind or a tragedy or a crisis sometimes before we actually see from the natural into the spirit realm that God is actually busy, busy, busy in your life. Because many times, well, all the time, God is present and many times we don't see it and we're not aware of it. In other words, Jacob had seemed to take the land for granted and perhaps was even looking for greater, past greater pastures. He was looking for someplace else to go. But it took God to reveal Himself and to show Jacob that the ground that he was on was His to be taken for the kingdom of God. And it became the house of God. And I believe that God is speaking to us today prophetically and saying to us, the ground on which I have placed you is to be taken for the kingdom of God. That I've given you the assignment to be responsible for the territory wherein you lie. I think of how many people actually want to escape the place that God has put them. How many people want to escape the desert? I still hear it after all these years. People wanting to escape the desert. They're looking for greener pastures. And literally greener pastures. <laughs> Because for some reason, the desert just doesn't seem to appeal to them anymore. But I want you to understand something. God is in this place. Yes. Jacob didn't realize God was in that place, but God was there. Guess what? He was in a desert as well. Matter of fact, the desert will look very much like the desert that you and I live in right here in good old Victorville, USA. But it took God to reveal himself to Jacob for his eyes to be open and for his heart to really lock, lock in to the place where he was. And so I, I think sometimes the reason why many people want to get out of the place where they are is because they don't know who they are. Therefore, they don't know their assignment from God for a specific geography where God has placed them. Identity. It always comes back to identity. Who are you and why are you? Who are you and why are you? And where are you? And all of these things start to come together and converge into defining our destiny, our purpose for existence. And yet, God is poised to do a great work as soon as we discover who we are. As soon as we discover why we are, and as soon as we discover where we are. God is looking for a people committed and stable in difficult situations. That's really why many people want to 
relocate is because maybe things aren't working out for them so well in this place. Maybe they've experienced tragedy or crisis or things that cause bad memories for them. And they would rather go someplace and start fresh and start anew. But God is looking for people who are willing to rise up in a level of faith that's going to cause them to push through every adversity in your life. Whether it's crisis or, or difficulty or tribulation, God is positioning us and preparing us as a people to be overcomers, not underachievers. I want to be an overcomer, amen? I want to be able to rise up in faith, not in my strength, but in faith in God to say, Lord, I trust you and I believe in you. And, and as many times as I've wanted to bail out and go someplace else, I know you've called me here. I know you have a purpose for me. I know who I am in you. And when we can come with that conviction and with that passion, then we can know that God will truly show up in revelatory ways and reveal Himself in ways you've never seen before, just like He did for Jacob. Are you out there? So the prophetic dream of Jacob so impacted his life that he was never the same again. He became keenly aware of his God, his identity, his calling, and the place to fulfill divine purpose. And because God is sovereign, his hand was in everything in Jacob's life, leading Jacob right to where he was on that particular day. As a matter of fact, we can see that Jacob was the master's plan. He was the master's plan. While Jacob was oblivious most of his life up until this point, God had him right where God wanted him. You might look at your journey, you might look at your circumstances and situations, and you might be a little bit, uh, you know, not confident that God knows where you are. As a matter of fact, you know, that was one of the things we said early on here when we came, is that, that God led us to the desert, but oftentimes we felt like He forgot where He put us. Anybody ever felt that way before? Where you know where you are, but you wonder if God forgot where He left you. And I think many times in Jacob's life, he knew God because he was raised in a Christian home. But he had gone his own way so often, but he thought that God wasn't in these places where he was going, yet God was guiding him and leading him every step of the way. Even in his own foolishness, God was involved. See, God's involved in our foolishness. He's not willing that you be foolish, but He will use your foolishness in order to achieve His own plans. Why? Because God is sovereign. And God is all-knowing. He knows you're a fool. Right? He wasn't shocked by the foolish decisions that we make in our life. He's not overtaken by that. Going, oh, I just had more expectation of them than that. No. He doesn't have any more expectations of you than what He already knows. And He knows everything about you. And He knows the plans that He has for you, says the Lord. For hope, and for future, and for prosperity. And so in Jacob's life, Jacob was the plan of God. And God's sovereignty led Jacob to this place. Now I want you to notice something about this place. Because it was a divine direction that God had Jacob in if you notice the very, sorry, verse number 11, it says, and he came to what? A certain place. It didn't say he came to a place. It says he came to a certain place. It was a certain place. In other words, it was a land of opportunity. And, and that's what's in God's plan. God always has a certain place in His plan for your life and for my life. It's not just any place. It's a certain place. God is not abstract. And God is not random, but He's very definitive in, he, in what He does and what He wants to do in your particular life. He's always valued the earth. He's proved this by being specific with geography and territory and, and the way in which He's designed the planet. And the land that Jacob was led to was intended to be the place where the glory of God would radiate through those that would become the seed of the promise. Now, I believe that's true of us even today because this story about Jacob is a story about us. How do I know that? Because Jacob became Israel. And Israel was the, the, the model for the people of God in the Old Testament. 
And the church, the New Testament, according to the Apostle Paul, is spiritual Israel. So anything that is referred to in the Old Testament regarding Israel is picked up now and processed through grace and through the New Covenant and is applicable to all who make up the New Israel, the church of the living God. Now, that's why we can look at a story like this and prophetically apply the principles to it. So in our lives, we see that God has a certain place for you. God has a certain place for us. And it's in His plan, in that certain place, where we're to radiate the glory of God so that everyone outside that certain place can be impacted and touched by it. Can I get an amen? amen. So you are here for this purpose. The key is to believe it and to embrace it. We cannot require God to show up in some mystical, miraculous way, but rather to look into the Word of God and let it be enough to convince us of our identity and our destiny. How many of you know the Word of God is enough? And so we have to remember what God said to Thomas. Remember the disciple who came in and called him Doubting Thomas. And it was Thomas who required something. He required that he should touch the Lord physically before he would believe that Christ was truly resurrected. And yet Jesus said something to him when he showed up. He said, Thomas, blessed are those who will never see me, yet will believe me. And you may never see a miracle. You may never see a sign. You may never see a wonder. But that's okay. You don't need those to believe. All you need to do is trust God and trust His Word. Because His promises never return void. Amen? Amen? Jacob did something amazing that would communicate great truth to us. He did something. He, he was in this certain place where God had led him. And as a result of what he was beginning to feel and experience, the Bible says that he took a stone, and he took a stone from that place, which I call a rock of revelation. And he laid his head upon that stone. I don't have a stone up here to give you a, an object lesson as Pastor Charlie is so good to do. But if you can just visualize this with me, it's a stone that he, he lays his head on for a pillow. Now, I, I would have chosen a bush, <laughs> although there may not have been any bushes there in the desert. But he chose a stone, he laid his head on it, and as a result, he had a dream. Now, I'm convinced that this is prophetic for us. I'm convinced that we, like Jacob, need to lay our head against the certainty of God's Word. Now, if you take God's Word and just pretend this is the rock of revelation, amen? Now, Jesus is the rock of revelation, but this is the, the revealed Word that tells us about the rock of revelation. And so, the certainty of this book, the quality of this book, the, the perfection of this book it enables us by the Spirit to be able to lay our head on it. And with our head on it, God is able to reveal Himself through the Word of God. So this becomes a rock of revelation in the sense that that rock, that stone that Jacob laid his head on became a, a connecting point to something that was about to transpire in his life. Because the Bible says that he began to have a dream. Now, all of our dreams ought to originate from God's Word. All our dreams, all our vision, all of our hope, all of our destiny should all be impacted and affected by the rock of revelation of who Jesus Christ is, which we discover through His Word and by the power of His Spirit. And when we lay our head against the certainty of God's Word and we're trusting in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, then God is going to reveal Himself just as He did to Jacob. He's going to show us things just like He did to Jacob that is going to change and revolutionize our very lives. That is why we emphasize, get the Word of God in you so that then you can get into the Word of God. And with that exchange of, of you and it and it in you, with that exchange, what it's going to produce in you is thoughts and dreams and visions that are going to catapult your life into something profound. That's the power of God and His Word. Can I get an amen? amen. So, 
This is what happened to Jacob. He laid his head down. Now, there was nothing mystical about the stone. Just like there's nothing mystical about the Bible. It's made out of leather and paper and ink. There's nothing mystical about this book. So it's, it's not a book in and of itself, but it is the message of the book. It is the revelation that is found in this book. It is the revelation of who Christ Jesus is in our life, in us and to us and through us. And so just like that stone, there was nothing mystical about it. It symbolized something. Symbolized the rock of revelation that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 16. So if you're there, just look over at Matthew 16 real quick. And let me call your attention to this New Testament explanation of, of what I believe to be a connection to the Genesis 28. Because when Jesus was dialoguing with His disciples... In Matthew 16, verse number 15, Jesus responded to Peter, and He said to them, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. And I tell you, you are Peter. So you see, identity is involved, right? He once was known as Simon, and now he's being re-identified as Peter. Why? Because of a revelation he received from the Father. And he says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock... Now, this rock is not Peter, as the, many of the Catholics might tell you. It's not Peter that's the rock. It's the revelation that is the rock. The revelation that Peter got. Because he says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this, this, not Peter, but this revelation you received is what I will build my church on. And here we go. And the gates, say gates. Yes. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So here we have a comparable New Testament passage of Scripture that is absolutely connected to the Genesis 28 passage of Scripture. Because we see the revelation of God through a dream to Jacob. We see the revelation of the Father through, through inspiration into Peter. We see a, a rock that becomes a, a symbol of revelation. We see Jesus saying this revelation is a rock that I will build upon. And it will be stable and it will be strong. He talks about later in that passage in Genesis 28 that there's a gateway. There's a gate in heaven that's opened up so that the powers of heaven can come to earth and begin to impact the earth. And Jesus says in Matthew 16, and this revelation, the gates of hell, the authorities of hell, will not be able to prevail against this revelation. Do you see the, the, the comparisons? So the gates of hell shall not prevail against what? The revelation that Christ is Lord. Savior and King of the earth. And this revelation will not be impeded. And the gates of hell will not keep the gates of God's kingdom from being established. Well, that ought to cause us to rejoice. Because we're all gates. And so if the, if the gates of hell will not prevail the gates of heaven, and we're all gates... It is through us that God will reveal Himself as we are united with His Word and His Spirit. So we all become gates, thoroughfares through which the power of God is able to work through. Amen? Amen. Stay with me. So just exactly what was the dream about that Jacob had? And how did it impact Jacob? Well, here's what the Bible says. It says that Jacob went to sleep in that certain place and experienced transformation by having a delightful dream. In the natural, Jacob didn't see anything, but when God peeled back the veil between the physical and the spiritual realms in a dream, Jacob saw that there was an activity in that place, as we've referred to already. And if we could, as I said, truly see in the spiritual realm, we would see that activity. May God open our eyes. So that we can see things that are not natural. Amen? I, I, I appreciate, you know, the prayers that people have been praying for William. And I want to ask you to continue to pray for William. 
uh, as he's struggling. And, and uh, Josiah gave us a report via text and said that he was almost right there at the verge of death. And that you prayed and Katie prayed and, and God just did something amazing and miraculous right there in the hospital room to the point where I think they're ready to move him again. So he's been on the verge of death several times and God's people are praying. And that's a way in which heaven opens up and God's activity pours through into the physical realm and can actually change things. Not because of our prayers, but because of God's will. And we're praying in accordance with God's will. That's how we get our prayers answered 100% of the time. Is when we pray according to God's will. Not according to our own will. So I want to encourage you to keep praying so that we see that there's an activity going on in a certain place on behalf of those that God has called. Amen? And so what do we need? We need to understand this activity. We need to not be caught off guard. You don't, you don't need to be living a single day without recognizing God is at work around you and, he's, and all the angels of heaven are at work around you as well. Because the moment we forget that, the enemy can seize that opportunity of forgetfulness in your life and cause you to do things you ought not do. See, it's all about focus. It's all about staying focused. Focused on the Word of God. Focused on the will of God. Focused on my identity in God. The moment you forget who you are in Christ, you become something else. The moment you forget that you have a purpose in God, and a destiny in God. The moment you forget that, you begin to pursue your own purpose and your own destiny. It's just a natural digression into something other than what God has for you when you begin to forget. So we need to always be aware that there is activity going on in the spirit realm on our behalf and in our life, in our families, in our living rooms, in our workplaces, and in our church. And so there's an activity in that place. But there's also, we see, an offering of the place. While God deserves and requires an offering, and we all believe that, in this particular case, He's actually giving us an offering. The land. He gives Jacob the land. Now, He doesn't give Jacob the land in terms of possessing it as owner, but He's giving Jacob the land in order to use it for the honor and glory of God because the Lord owns it all. But He gives us things to steward. And so just like He gave Jacob the land to steward for the glory of God, so too God is giving us the different things in our lives, whether it's our children. God has given you those children to steward their lives. No matter if they become rebellious teenagers or not, you still have a responsibility to steward them in the things of God. Come on. And we don't have any rebellious teenagers here today, do we? None whatsoever. We have godly, holy, wholesome, beautiful. Well, anyway. <laughs> but we steward our children. We steward our marriages. Come on. Your marriage doesn't belong to you. Your marriage belongs to God. So we steward that marriage in a way that's going to bring honor and glory to God. And so God has given us these things as an offering in order for us to steward those things to bring honor and glory to His name. And this expectation goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden where He says to tend the garden. The garden belonged to the Lord, but Adam and Eve were given responsibility to tend it, to cultivate it, to reproduce to take dominion. So it begins with our family, our community, and then beyond. There's an offering in the place. And then there's a promise in that place where Jacob was. God made a promise to Jacob and He makes promises to us through Christ and it's through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that Jesus came through. And therefore, we all are in faith in Christ of the seed of Abraham and therefore of the seed of Jacob. And so, God made that promise in verse 13 through 15 of Genesis 28. Go ahead and look at it again. He says, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Not just, you know, a small community of people, but all the 
families of the earth will be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. will bring you back to this land. And it's interesting about him saying, I'll bring you back to this land because God knew the future. He knew there would be ups and downs for Israel. And that many times they would be taken from the land. But God promised, no matter how many times you get taken from the land, He's going to bring you back. Come on. He's going to bring you back to what He's called you to. And whether it's a geography, or whether it's a vision, or a purpose, or whether it's a, some kind of calling, whatever it is, God is always going to bring you back to what He has intended for you to have hold of as a steward. And so God's made us promises that are founded in His Word and His promises that we can have personal freedom from sin, from guilt, from worldliness. He's promised us peace. He's promised us righteousness and joy in the Holy Ghost. He's promised us that in our families. He's promised that we can have godly influence in our community and in our city. Why does God make us these promises? It is all in an effort to get us to understand our primary calling to represent Him and His purpose for this world and the area we have been assigned. Now, I know I'm preaching fast, but I don't have much time. So I hope you got all that. But the key is, the greatest part of the promise is that there's going to be His presence in that place. You know why many people don't experience the presence of God? Because they're not in the place they're supposed to be. It's not that God isn't present there. He's just not present for them. Because when God shows up in presence, He shows up in manifested presence. So there's two types of presence. There's the omnipresence of God, which is a character, uh, a characteristic of God. Is it, it is omnipresence. God has the capacity to be all places at all times, everywhere at once. Okay? But that is not where we need to relate to God, in His omnipresence. We need to relate to God in His manifested presence. Which is when God shows up in time and space in a certain place. A certain place. Come on, say that. A certain place. And that certain place is the place God has designed for you to be where God will meet you in the way you need to be met in that certain place for the calling He designed you for. And if you're not functioning in the design that God has made you to, to function in, then God will be there in His omnipresence, but He will not be there in His manifested presence because He doesn't manifest Himself to those who are disobedient. So we have to find the place God has designed for us, and it's there we will see Him, not just in His omnipresence, but in His manifested presence. When God said in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he goes through the Great Commission, you know that, right? Then he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. He is saying, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world, so long as you are responding to the command that I have given you. But if you're not going and making disciples, you're not going into the places and the highways and hedges and the byways and the lanes and the roads that God has designed for us to go into and the neighborhood that you've been assigned to and, and the city and the community you've been assigned to. If you're not in the right place, then you won't experience the right kind of presence of God. Okay? And that's why a lot of people just go, I just don't hear God anymore. Yeah, I, just don't, I just don't feel God anymore. Well, you shouldn't base it on feelings, but the reality is it may be because, you know, God doesn't feel you. Do we never think about that? I don't feel God. Well, maybe God doesn't feel you. Because you're in the wrong place. Come on, get that. And so, this is a promise of His presence, but His obligation is that we're faithful and that we're obedient. And that we're submitted to the will of God in our lives. So you see, it was a divine direction. But there's also, a, there was a determined devotion that we see. It says in verse number 16, Then Jacob awoke from sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He knows it now. Why? Because he's come to the revelation that this is my certain place. And because this is my place and I'm taking ownership of it, I'm, I'm responding to God and saying, okay, God, I agree. See, that's what confession is. Confession is merely agreement. And what Jacob needed to do is come into agreement that this was the place that God intended for him to be. 
And once Eve came into that agreement, surely God is in this place. It's amazing how he didn't feel it before, and now he feels it, and he's experiencing it, and he knows it now. Because he is now more certain of who he is, and he's certainly certain of this place. And he says in verse 17, he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? It's amazing when you discover your place, and that God's present there in your life, how awesome that place becomes. I mean, there's been people in this church. I, I just, I can't understand why anybody would not be, want to be a part of this church. I know I'm a little bit biased. But you know why I'm biased? Because this is my place. And because it's my place, it's my certain place, I see God in this place. I feel God in this place. I experience God in this place. Oh, this is an awesome place. Oh, God is here. that way. And I don't understand it, but they don't feel that way. Maybe it's because this isn't their place. That's okay. Go find the place that God has designed for you. But I hope this place can become that place for you. Okay. But I'm not going to fret anymore over the fact that not everyone thinks this is their place. But whatever place you discover God in for you, that place is going to be awesome and you need to stick with that place. Don't be wishy-washy. I don't care if you go down the street to Joe Blow you know, Church. As long as that's God's place for you, stay with it. And don't keep coming back here every three months. You're not supposed to say that, Pastor. You're supposed to try to encourage people to come. If God wants you here, I want you here. But if God don't want you here, I would be wrong to try to hold you here. Come on. Because you've got to find your certain place. And you've got to see God in that place. You've got to experience the presence of God in that place so that you can come to the, 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 the idea that this is awesome. And it's awesome for you. Amen? Amen? So there's a presence in that place. There's a determined devotion. He said it's awesome. This is none other than what? The house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jason took the stone he put under his head. Now here's what's significant. He took the stone that he had placed under his head, and the Bible says that he now sits it up as a pillar. He stands it upright as a pillar, and then he poured oil over the top of it. And in verse 19, he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first, but now it's being changed. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way, that I go, and I, it will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, that I come to my Father's house in peace, and the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that, I, that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. He's describing the church. So there's a picture of that place. God showed him this picture, and it struck fear in his heart and humbled him, and he recognized the house of God, and it compelled him to take up a position in that place. He established a position. He took the stone, the rock of revelation, he turned it upright, made it into a pillar in that place, he anointed it, and established an identity. See it? He says, this is Bethel, an identity. This is the house of God. And then Jacob said, a prayer in that place. Prayer always follows an encounter with God. It is because of reestablished relationship. Jacob was so aware of God's presence now that he couldn't help but take advantage of claiming his blessing. What was the blessing? The same blessing that was given to his grandfather. Abraham's blessing. And this blessing, this covenantal blessing found in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham is now being repeated to Jacob. Why? Because Jacob, though he was a scoundrel, and though he was a trickster, and though he had been all over doing his own thing, God brought him back to the place where he belonged, gave him some promises, gave him a, a revelation of who God was, reestablished his identity, and then with the reestablishment of identity, reestablished the promises and the covenant that he made with his grandfather. See, that's what God will do in your life. You may be on your own route for a while, but when God brings you back to that place that you belong, and you start experiencing the presence of God, 
and you start acknowledging the awesomeness of God, then God will re-identify you and re-establish His covenant with you. How many of you have promises from God? All right. You know, we have promises in His Word, of course, but we have promises in His Word that have different uh, meaning for us based upon circumstances and situations going on in our lives. But we can apply those promises in certain situations. And sometimes we look at those promises and say, well, God made promises, but it's been 10 years, it's been 15 years, it's been 20 years. We need to reevaluate whether or not God is causing you to learn how to be patient or if you're on the wrong track and you need to reestablish your place in God so that God can reestablish your identity in Him and therefore reconstitute the covenants and promises that He's made in your life. It's always important to evaluate. Amen? And so we see a pledge in that place. Jacob made a pledge. We need to be making pledges. We need to make commitments to God. We need to reevaluate our lives constantly and re, re up, if you will, with God. The gospel in the gate is that it represents the very thing that Christ died for, a place where His name is recorded and glorified, the house of God, the people of God, the gate of heaven. So let's talk about that for about five minutes and then we'll let you go because I have too much to say to keep you here all day. And we'll continue this next week. But let me just mention the material produced. Jesus prayed, Father, thy kingdom come on earth. What? As it is in heaven. He also states in Matthew 16 that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And even though it is fully the power of the Lord that produces the end result, he has made it clear, hear this, that we are the tools He uses to build His church. Now, He builds His church, but He uses tools to do so. And we are what the Bible describes as co-laborers with Christ. To disciple people and build them up in Christ, which is at the same time building up the church. The question is, what kind of material are you in this moment in time? Are you a reed or a rock? Now, when we go back to Matthew 16, we recognize that Jesus was talking to Simon Peter. He went by Simon. And Simon is a very important name because in, in his name we see his personality type. Before Peter was called Peter, Simon, it means reed, which is a tall, woody, perennial grass. It's what you see, you know, when Moses was in the basket going down the river. You've seen scenes of that in Ten Commandments or other movies where there's this tall, reed grass and, and the basket floated into the... That's, that's a reed. And that's what Simon meant. And what Simon means is that he was easily swayed by the wind. Tossed about by opinion of other men. But then Jesus comes on the scene and He says, Who do men say that I am? And Peter, Simon, says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus says, You've spoken well. My Father has revealed this to you. Therefore, I now call you Peter. Peter means a piece of the rock. It doesn't mean just rock. It means a piece of the rock. In other words, Simon had just a piece of who Christ was. Meaning that there are more Peters necessary. Because all of us have to become the rocks, a piece of the rock of revelation. Whereby I have a piece of the rock. I don't have all revelation. You don't have all the revelation. But together, we start forming the fullness of the revelation of who Christ is. Because the fullness of who Christ is will be revealed in the body of Come on, the body of? Christ. The body of Christ. We're called the body of Christ for a reason. Because the world needs to see the full revelation of the body of Christ. And the only way they can see the full revelation of the body of Christ is that the pieces of that body carry with them a piece of revelation of who Christ is so that like a puzzle, when we all come together, there's a picture of Jesus. That's why the body of Christ is important. The church is important. And so Peter was re-identified as someone who had a piece of the revelation 
of who Jesus Christ is. And therefore, he became a rock that could be useful in building the church. So I close with this. What are you, a reed or a rock? Are you someone who doesn't know who you are and you kind of drift here and there with whatever message comes along or whatever, whatever fad comes along, whatever new church pops up and you want to go check that out? Are you a reed or are you a rock? Because it takes rocks who become pillars to build the house of God. We're going to talk about that next week. We're going to go deeper into what a reed is. We're going to go deeper into what a rock or a stone is. We're going to go deeper into what a pillar is. Because how many of you know, the house of God needs pillars to hold it up. Stone people build the house of God. Pillar people extend the house of God. Pillars, the further you put them apart, the more expanse there can be to the building. We're going to talk about that. So you need to be here for that. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray.